Well, good afternoon. Uh, and, and thank you, Kate, for that warm introduction. Um, give me one moment. All right, so, so, so as, as Kate mentioned, what I'm going to do today is to talk about um, segregation, the, the topic of the previous video, but with, with two, in two different ways than the video did so. The first is I'm going to focus on uh, Washington, D.C. and the D.C. region, and so it will be very specific to, to um, this place in your work. Uh, and then the second is that I'll be exploring the period a bit before the rise of the New Deal and, and sort of federally directed housing segregation and the period after the Great Society and, and sort of the uh, a period that where, you know, you, you no longer have federally directed housing segregation, but you still have a great deal of discrimination in housing. And so I'll try to get a, a much larger vision covering approximately uh, 100 years. Um, and we'll do all of that in 30 minutes. It shouldn't be a problem uh, at all. Um, so let me just begin with an article that I found from 1963 in the Washington Post. Today, the Washington Negro places inadequate housing at the top of his list of grievances. So began an August 11th, 1963 article in the Washington Post. The article is jarring considering that the district was both known to be far less segregated than many other US cities and that it was packed with some of the most affluent African-Americans in the country. And of course, with that affluence, African-Americans would be able to buy homes in nice, as, as people would call it at the time, white neighborhoods. Moreover, the authors registered a seething black discontent, not simply among the, the residents of the ghetto in places like Shaw, but among the middle and upper class black folk who were then creating a gold coast of African-American wealth along 16th Street, far outside the center city. For all of these people, the paper noted, and I'm quoting here again, the Negro's home is a daily reminder that here in the nation's capital, the nation's most open city for Negroes, doors are still shut. So my task today, as I understand it, is to place this article in historical context and to explain where we have been, why, and where we are now on the issues of race, migration, and housing. Uh, as part of that task, I'm going to argue three things. The first is, is not at all surprising to you, and that is that 20th and 21st century housing segregation in the D.C. metro region is a product of public policy and private discrimination, and you could have gotten that from the film that we just watched. And so I'm really going to dial down into the two other things that I'm going to be arguing in this talk, which is that inside the city, uh, housing discrimina discrimination created two different racialized housing landscapes in the 20th century. The first was a center city black belt before 1968. And the second was an east-west divide after 1968. Uh, the last thing I'll be arguing is that in the years since 1968, the metropolitan region has witnessed a series of uh, race and class migrations across Southern and Eastern avenues that have frustrated the goal of housing integration. Now, Let's get into the story here. Um, and I'll, I'll do this in three parts. I'll start with um, the, the creation of a segregated housing landscape uh, before 1948. Um, the roots of housing segregation in the district go back to the late 19th century. Uh, for most of the city's history up to that time, different class and racial groups would live in relative proximity to each other. Keep in mind that most of the city before 1900 is concentrated below Florida Avenue uh, inside Rock Creek uh, and uh, the Anacostia. And so it's really quite a small walking city and it's very hard for people to get away from each other. Different class and racial groups would be clustered in the city, but generally you could find a person who was working in a very rich family's home, living just a block away in a very poor home uh, in the same neighborhood. <clears throat> but beginning in the late 19th century, Washington real estate agents, developers, and lenders began building a race and class segregated market. Agents steered buyers to different neighborhoods based on race. Lenders denied African-Americans credit in the legitimate housing market independent of their ability to pay. And white developers used covenants to create racial exclusivity. And I'm going to focus for a moment on covenants because they really are terribly important to local efforts to segregate the landscape before the federal government gets involved in the 1930s. So uh, covenants are contracts in which property holders agree to restrict the sale 
rent or transfer of their homes to a racial and religious minority. And you can see the text of a covenant from, uh, from the city uh, in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Um, they could be written to a deed by a developer. I live in Shepherd Park and there was a covenant written directly into my deed when my house was built in 1927. Um, or uh, if your house was, was older than a time when a lot of people were using covenants, uh, you could essentially get together with all of your neighbors and all agree uh, that you were going to adopt covenants and kind of make a legal uh, uh, sort of pact with your neighbors uh, that none of you would in fact sell your home, rent it, or otherwise transfer it to people of color or other groups that you wanted to keep out. Now, D.C.'s first covenanted neighborhood is, is quite old. It was Uniontown, located across the Anacostia River from the Navy Yard. And it was built in 1854, and it was, it was built exclusively for whites, people who were going to, white workers who were going to work in the Navy Yard across the river. Uh, but covenants really don't take off in the city until the early 20th century. And that's specifically because there was a serious effort in cities around the country uh, in, in the 19-teens um, to segregate by neighborhood or by block. Uh, those laws were challenged by the NAACP, taken to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court uh, deemed them unconstitutional in 1917. And so the fallback legal uh, way to make a neighborhood segregated became restrictive covenants. And so as a result, in the 1910s, restrictive covenants proliferate across the city. Many of the neighborhoods that are built above Florida Avenue were covenanted from the beginning. And so you can see a, a picture from Northgate here and they were advertised as such. Uh, it was a virtue as far as many in the real estate industry were concerned that a neighborhood was segregated uh, through covenants. I should point out here um, that uh, easily the, the, the best folks to talk, who can talk about the issue of restrictive covenants uh, are the folks at Prologue DC. And I, I have a picture of their website in the lower right-hand corner, but they have mapped all of the deeded covenants and uh, sort of agreement covenants uh, that you can that they could possibly find across the entire city on an interactive map. And so please do check out their website. <clears throat> now, um, the Supreme Court actually uh, hears a case about restrictive covenants. Um, and it just so happens that that case comes out of Washington, DC, and that was Corrigan versus Buckley. Um, and it, it comes off of S, S Street, uh, right about halfway between DuPont Circle and the U Street area. And you had a very affluent black family. Uh, the, the husband was a doctor uh, and they could, afford a house, they could afford a house in a nice white neighborhood. Uh, and the white neighbors uh, who had covenants on their houses sued, in fact, sued the seller. Um, and the Supreme Court agreed uh, that in fact, um, these were legally enforceable private um, uh, agreements between homeowners. Uh, and so again, once the Supreme Court gives their stamp of approval, covenants spread across the region uh, and across the United States. Now, just a short eight years after Cor Corrigan versus Buckley, which happened in 1926, um, the federal government expanded and institutionalized this form of discrimination that I talked about when it came to restrictive covenants. Um, when the federal government began ensuring 30-year fixed mortgages in response to the wide-ranging homelessness of the Great Depression, it created maps that determined the risks of lending in different areas. Following the lead of local real estate agents and developers, um, the federal government determined risk for these loans based in large part on race, with white sections receiving the highest grade and black or mixed race sections receiving the lowest. And so I'll just read a bit of text that was attached to this specific map, which is a homeowner's loan corporation map uh, for the DC region. Uh, the, the folks at Prologue DC have looked for FHA maps for, for DC and they have not been able to find any, but you do have a homeowner's loan corporation map. And it says this, um, all of these areas on the map are graded A to F and the planners, uh, federal planners instructed local lenders that type F areas. And they were talking about Southwest, Capitol Hill, Foggy Bottom and Georgetown and most of what we now call Shaw, quote, have lived their span of life as residential areas and are now declining into very undesirable sections. These areas are subject to commercial and industrial encroachment and the pr properties are no longer good residential investment. These areas house over three fourths of the Negroes in the metropolitan uh, district and are showing the effects of Negro occupancy, tending to become slums if they are not already. Um, and so with those F ratings for the vast majority of African-Americans in the city, what you end up getting is that 
banks refuse to lend to African Americans in these places, either to fix up their houses or to purchase their houses, which means that these places become slums. In other words, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy on the part of the federal government. Now, this combination of private prejudice and public policy pushed African Americans into an inner city black belt that looped around the downtown and occupied some of the oldest houses in the city. Based on the guidance I just read, lenders then starved the area of money, uh, essentially making it into the slum that they had just defined. Just to give you an idea of what that means, Black homeowners received just 2.1% of all FHA and VA-backed mortgages issued in the city in the years surrounding World War II. Black population at the time is approximately 30% and growing very quickly. Now, let's talk about how this segregated Black Belt falls apart, but segregation does not go away. Now, as the FHA was encouraging banks to starve Black communities of money, mass right migration was reshaping the city. During and after World War II, the district's population jumped to approximately 660,000 in 1940, and then ballooned to 900,000 during the height of the war emergency in 1943. It would then settle in the 1950s at about 802,000. And so the city was bigger then than it ever had been previously or has been since. It was absolutely packed with people. Um, and the people who are coming into the city at the time are in equal parts black and white. Uh, it's, it's a mass migration of all different racial groups. Um, these folks, however, entered a thoroughly segregated housing market. Hemmed in by the invisible walls erected by lenders, real estate agents, and white homeowners, blacks packed into the center city black belt, which expanding at the edges came to encompass most of the area below Florida Avenue and between Rock Creek and the Anacostia River. Most white newcomers, on the other hand, moved to the segregated neighborhoods that ringed the center city, or the growing suburbs of Prince George's, Montgomery, and Arlington counties. Yet following the Supreme Court's 1948 decision in Heard versus Hodge, invalidating restrictive covenants, and the 1954 decision, Bowling versus Sharp, striking down the city's segregated schools, many white residents, realizing that the federal government would not protect segregation of their homes and of their schools, fled the city entirely for the segregated suburbs. And the scale of the demographic reshuffling that occurred in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s is astonishing. Between 1950 and 1960, 170,000 white DC residents left for the suburbs. Um, in the 1960s, another 130 left. I think the story that many of us uh, believe is that, well, the riots happened in 1968 and then much of the city's white population left. But by the time the riots occurred, 300,000 white DC residents had already fled the city. Now, African Americans, on the other hand, um, could not go to the suburbs. The suburbs are still closed to them. Um, and so what you end up having there uh, is that during the 1950s, 130,000 African Americans pack into the city. Uh, and then in the 1960s, another 125,000 come into the city. And so here's where you have a, a literal musical chairs. Um, a, a city that was roughly 60% black uh, going into 1950 is seven, I'm, I'm sorry, 60% white going into 1950 is 70% black in 1970. So that the populations have quite literally flipped. Now the rapid movement of whites out of the city alarmed city elites and they began searching for ways to bring them back. They supported the small pockets of gentrification that had sprung up in Georgetown, Foggy Bottom, and Capitol Hill. Uh, and so here you see articles from the Evening Star, uh, the city's other major newspaper at the time, which was literally uh, cheerleading for gentrification of Georgetown, Foggy Bottom, Capitol Hill, and Calorama, which was less displacing poor people as just watching rich people fix up their own homes. Um, but the paper would even go beyond, you know, uh, sort of editorializing. It was, in fact, uh, uh, lobbying members of Congress, keep in mind that the city was, was essentially run directly by Congress and the three commissioners at the time, to not tear down alley houses, uh, which it was mandated to do, um, 
if in fact they were being gentrified by whites. Of course, if those alley houses still contained African Americans, the paper would believe that they should be torn down. The second thing that city elites did was they began to use new federal tools for bringing white middle-class residents back to the city. Um, urban renewal and highway construction to be specific. Um, and the idea was either to bring them back or if they could not do that, to make it really easy for them to get from their jobs downtown to their homes out in the suburbs. Uh, the first urban renewal site in the nation uh, is here in Washington, DC, it's in Southwest. Um, and as you can see, Southwest is a, a very old uh, portion of the city in the upper left-hand picture uh, is a row house community. There's about 23,000 people there, 75% of whom are African-American. Um, it was not the nicest neighborhood, but many of the people that lived here owned their homes, had fixed them up very nicely, and they lived in proximity to folks who were quite desperately poor. The federal government decided that the best way to deal with what they called this blight on the city uh, and to generate housing for federal bureaucrats who would be able to walk to work was to bulldoze the entire neighborhood. Uh, it does so in the early 1950s. You can see by 1954, everything but the churches are gone. Uh, and in its stead, it builds a new modern middle-class neighborhood that instead of being 75% black, like it was before demolition was 75% white. What it also does is try to ram highways through the city. And as the film pointed out before I, I jumped on the screen here, um, the way that highway planners typically uh, decided where these highways would, would go was to look for the path of least resistance, look for the people who were, who were the least powerful and who were easily scapegoated by those in power. Um, and so DC was supposed to have uh, a highway system that would rival what you see today in Houston. Uh, there was gonna be the, an outer loop, a mid loop and an inner loop. Uh, you can see that only the outer loop is built. Uh, the red lines are what was planned. The blue lines are what actually got built. Um, but that was largely because there was a massive cross-class interracial protest movement led by people like uh, Sammy Abbott and Reginald Booker of the Emergency Committee on the Transportation Crisis um, who fought against these highways for over a decade. Uh, and so whenever you're coming down um, uh, 395 towards New York Avenue in the city and you just boom, stop at a stoplight after being on a highway for hours, uh, you can thank Sammy Abbott, Reginald Booker for saving approximately 30,000 people's homes uh, by stopping those highways um, and perhaps lengthening your commute a little bit, but such is life. Now, all of this uh, activity on the part of federal planners um, failed to stem white flight. It just, it couldn't stop it at all. In fact, much of it was implemented after white flight had already uh, run much of its course, but it did create a new racial geography for the city. And that, that's my second point, and it's terribly important here. Previously, you had this inner city black belt that looped around downtown from Foggy Bottom over into Southwest. But with the de demolition of Southwest, with the gentrification of Foggy Bottom in Georgetown, what you get instead uh, is an east-west divide. And that's because of three things. The first is that members of the black middle class uh, who still want good housing, and they, they have large numbers, flood northward into the middle class communities that had previously been uh, barred to them by restrictive covenants. Um, second thing uh, is that those gentrifiers cut off half of the old black belt on the west side of the city. And then the third thing is that poor people displaced from gentrifying neighborhoods like Capitol Hill and Foggy Bottom and particularly Southwest flood across the river into previously all white neighborhoods like Anacostia, which was 85% white in 1950. It was literally the place in the city you went to go listen to country music. Um, and they flipped the demographics there. So Anacostia goes from 85% white to 85% black. Uh, over the course of the period that I just, that I have up here on the screen from the 40s to um, the 70s. And so now we have the east-west divide. Now, that last map looks a lot like the city's racial landscape today, but I don't want to give the impression that the city's uh, demographics settled in the late 1960s. Um, to the contrary, they continued to change dramatically. Um, as in the past, the spur for these changes was public policy. And again, DC played a decisive role in the formation of national housing policy. Um, 
So you all know we, we're actually uh, on the um, we're actually right here on the, on the uh, anniversary of the passage of the Fair Housing Act. But you all know that in August of 1968, uh, Lyndon Johnson passed the Fair Housing Act, um, which made segregation illegal, uh, particularly in the suburbs where it was still hanging on quite tenaciously. Um, but that was no easy task. He had been trying to pass the Fair Housing Act for years. And conservatives, after really being knocked back on their heels in 1964 and 1965 with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, regrouped in 1966 and 1967 and pushed back hard against any additional expansion of rights or resources for poor Black people. And so you could see uh, members of Congress uh, in uh, 1967 laughingly saying, uh, laughingly uh, sort of joking about how they had stopped a bill that would have given cities additional money for rat abatement. They called it a civil rats bill, and they were really proud that they had uh, blocked this money, keeping in mind that D.C. was one of the leading cities in rat infestations in Black neighborhoods in the country. Many of you recall that the famed uh, uh, activist Julius Hobson actually had rat rallies uh, in the city where he demanded that Congress and the city government do something about rats in places like Shaw. Um, so how does Johnson overcome this opposition? Well, primarily by, during a, a meeting at the White House with holdouts in Congress, pointing out the window up the hill and showing them the smoke rising from Shaw in Columbia Heights during the April uh, uh, Easter weekend uh, uprising. And he said, you see those, see that smoke? That's black folks rioting up in Shaw and Columbia Heights. You need to put a fair housing bill on my desk right now. Uh, and he got that bill just a couple of days later on April 11th. Pardon me. Um, now, <clears throat> during the 1960s, um, discriminatory housing policy had turned those parts of the old black belt that had not been gentrified into even worse slums. On the eve of the April 1968 revolt, the Washington Post found that three quarters of the units in Shaw were owned by absentee landlords. Um, many of those landlords freely admitted to a reporter who they knew was going to write it in the paper that I don't put any money into my properties because I'm waiting for the city to come in and bulldoze the whole place for urban renewal and give me a payout or I'm waiting for gentrifiers to come in and push out all the poor black people and give me a payout. But until that happens, I'm not doing anything. So rats, broken windows, whatever. My renters will have to deal with it because they've got no place else to go. Um, and one of the major drivers of the revolt was in fact this slum housing and the people who uh, made it that way. But now able to escape the ghetto after um, the 1968 Fair Housing Act, the black middle class, which had already been moving uptown after um, the end of restrictive covenants in 1948, crossed Eastern and Southern Avenue into Prince George's County and to a much lesser extent into Montgomery County. Um, and Prince George's was an obvious choice, I should point out, for many African-Americans in the area. Um, black federal employees had established two black towns in Prince George's um, back before the advent of federal intervention in the housing market. And so this is in the 20s and 30s. Um, they were Brentwood, North Brentwood and Fairmont Heights. And so you had a significant black population in the county already. Uh, in 1950, there uh, approximately 10% of the county is African-American. So African-Americans focus on going to Prince George's, not to Montgomery, which was far less welcoming. Um, <clears throat> now, in the 1970s and 1980s, um, developments in the district actually accelerated this black middle class out migration to the suburbs. Um, first heroin uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, then cocaine in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and then crack hit the district particularly hard. Um, and they accelerate this black out migration. Um, in 1985 is when, when crack hits and it really makes the city very dangerous. Um, the city was already dealing with a great deal of crime and a great deal of drug addiction because of heroin and cocaine, but it's really crack that, that begins to rend the social fabric in many uh, center city black uh, communities, um, and particularly because it's so lucrative. Uh, and so what you have is that 
out of town uh, drug gangs as well as local ones uh, begin fighting over markets, uh, markets like the Hanover Place drug market in Northwest. Um, and they precipitate a bloodbath. Uh, and so what you see is that by 1998, uh, the number of people killed in DC is well over one per day uh, across a given year. And we become the per capita um, murder capital of the United States of America, a, a, um, a title that we would hold intermittently all the way through the early 1990s. Uh, and so it was really quite dangerous downtown and on the east side of the city. If you look at a dot map of murders during this time, it was quite rare to have uh, any of this violence make its way across Rock Creek Park into the white parts of the city. Um, and so with middle and increasingly working class African Americans heading for the suburbs trying to escape this crime and this social disorganization, the black population of Prince George's spikes and many whites fled before the African American advance into the surrounding counties of Charles uh, and, uh, and others. Um, in 1990, Prince George's County uh, uh, becomes a black majority with 51% being recorded in that year's census. That is up from 38% um, just one decade before. So it's a very quick turnover in the county. And it's because you see that same dynamic of black in-migration and white out-migration in the county that you saw previously a couple decades before in the city. Um, Montgomery County still sees mild black uh, in migration. It's not as heavy as Prince George's County. And so by 1990, the black population of Montgomery County is only 12%. Now, ironically, not long after African-Americans became a majority in Prince George's um, and made inroads into Montgomery, events conspired to bring large numbers of white Americans back to the city itself. Um, and this was fueled by a number of factors, but I think the most important are uh, an expansion of the federal government uh, through privatization under Bill Clinton and his successors. Um, and then the new urbanism of the early 19, uh, the, the early 2000s, where uh, people were looking for livable, walkable neighborhoods. They, they found suburban neighborhoods, um, not just energy wasting, but also time wasting. I mean, people were sitting in some of the worst traffic in the country commuting in and out of the district. Um, and you could really see this after Hurricane Katrina with gas prices spiking all the way up to four and five dollars a gallon. It was really expensive to live in the suburbs. But probably the biggest driver was the housing boom of the early 2000s. Um, all of a sudden property that people were giving away for taxes, uh, that the city was literally auctioning off for a dollar in the 1980s. Um, is exceedingly valuable. And so folks are flooding into the district to take advantage of that economic opportunity uh, as well. Um, now the housing boom uh, proceeded, uh, as the housing boom proceeded, the place once known as Chocolate City got increasingly younger, richer, and whiter until in 2011, the black population slipped below 50% for the first time since 19. 57. And again, you'll remember uh, that there's two things going on here. There's a black out migration to Prince George's County, initially escaping uh, violence uh, and, and rough city services. Remember, the city does go bankrupt in 1994. Um, but, on, but then on the back of that, um, the city becomes increasingly expensive for poor people. And so you see an increasingly working class and poor out migration from the city. Um, and then you have a white migration sort of going against that from the county's into the city. That was really accelerated to about a thousand people per month after the Great Recession because DC was one of the few places in the country that was still hiring. Uh, and so uh, a, a tremendous number of people with college degrees, a little bit of money from their parents, flooded into the city and ballooned the city's population as a result. Now, Today, the largely contiguous black community once relegated to the inner city black belt is spread between three different jurisdictions. There's approximately 550,000 people in Prince George's, uh, 320 in DC, and this is the black population, and about 200,000 in Montgomery County. Um, the way that my, my colleague, Natalie Hopkinson points this out is she said, Chocolate City just moved east uh, in the years after the 1970s. And though comparatively more affluent than any of its peers in the US and supported by anti-discrimination law, 
It continues to struggle with the sticky residue of over a century, century of housing discrimination and the highly lucrative and newly refashioned forms of private prejudice. Like many banks targeting the eastern wards of DC and Prince George's County for subprime loans during the housing bubble, for instance. And the figures here are staggering as well. Buyers making more than 200,000 a year who purchased a house in the run-up to the housing crash receive subprime loans 30% of the time in these areas. That's the highest figure in the nation. So imagine that the most affluent areas in the nation are getting subprime loans at a higher rate than anywhere else in the nation. And those who refinanced in these areas had similar problems receiving similar predatory terms. It's not surprising then that Prince George's County has the third highest floor foreclosure rate per capita in the nation and still is struggling with people trying to adjust their rates today. So let me conclude with this. Much like in 1963, many DC Metro African Americans list housing as one of their chief concerns. In Prince George's County, many residents are still fighting to adjust the terms of predatory subprime loans. Many, in fact, are still underwater. In the district, many poor African Americans are battling gentrification and demanding affordable housing. And though the times are different, the problem remains the same. African Americans struggle to gain equal access to decent and affordable housing in a real estate market shaped by racism. And because if these persistent, um, pardon me, because of these persistent problems, all of us here in the DMV are depending on all of you to continue the good work of fighting for a housing market in which all Americans get a fair shake. In that task, I wish you Godspeed. Thank you.